So today I'm going to talk about my design journey and uh, I'm going to cover a couple of things. I'm going to start with my first commercial digital project and then go into all of the various sort of design setups I've worked in and what I kind of learned from each setup. Uh, of course, this is like my journey, so hopefully some of it is going to be useful to you guys. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm the head of design and UX at Referral Candy, which is a Singapore-based startup. Um, and we basically make automated referral programs for any uh, e-commerce store. Uh, in my former role, I was uh, the VP design at Postman, uh, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, it's basically an API service for developers. And uh, basically, we helped a postman grow to more than 4 million developers and still growing and uh, you know it's a massive platform now so let's just quickly start off uh, I call it level zero which is like my first commercial uh, digital project I was trained as a graphic designer which is like in print uh, and the moment I went into the industry I decided I don't want to do print <laughs> And so my first project was uh, actually a commercial project that I convinced my boss that I really can do website design, even though I'd never done it before. Um, so yeah, the first story is this website <laughs> that I made. It's a bit embarrassing to, sh to show it. Um, but it was basically a, a website for a mall. Uh, and what I did was I created abstract forms and then I was very interested and excited about interaction and interactive stuff. So the top half of the website is an interactive experience, which you can click through. And the bottom half is just the normal website that the client wanted. <laughs> so uh, I think after this project, what I learned was if the client likes it, then all good. It's approved. It goes live. And that was, I think, my first learning. Uh, in the design industry. The um, other thing I think that started happening was that I worked in a lot of design studios. And just keep in mind, this is really long ago. This is like 10 years ago. So um, design studios are just lovely places of like six to eight designers. Everybody is a designer. It's a really comfortable, cozy sort of space. Uh, the person who owns the company is also a designer, so you are just in this amazing place where you can just focus on the craft, on the pixels, on the print. You are very protected in a, in a design studio. Uh, so I really uh, learned a lot from design studios because I had time and space to develop my own style. A lot of des uh, design studios have their own style already because the founder's style is kind of imprinted on the studio. So um, I think what I realized was, hey, as a designer, you can have your own style. You don't have to do everything the client tells you to do. And I started to explore this sort of geometric style that I had. This is um, a branding project I did for a diamond company. It's very random, but I think I had a lot of fun with it. And at, by this point, I was doing everything from logo design, print design, web, like end-to-end -end kind of brand application. And so I think uh, the story I want to tell about Studio is this one project I did uh, where we worked with this lady who wanted to start her own uh, event conference in India. And that was a pretty huge thing because in those days, it was very new. TED was very new. Uh, and it was supposed to be a TEDx, which she wanted to brand. And it was super fun. And I think, the f I think it's the first time where I really saw how important it was for the whole team to work really well together, the client really you know, in it 150%, uh, the designers in it, everybody was really in it. Um, and this is the uh, logo that I made, uh, which again was my, you know, again, developing my personal style, which is this sort of geometric, retro kind of style as a graphic designer. And uh, it was really interesting to see that being converted into um, something like this on the stage. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, this event is still going on now after all of these years. And, and they're still developing the brand even now. And even after I left that studio, I still saw the way the logo was 
you know, continuing to be used. And that made me realize as a designer that, you know, if you do your job well, if you, if you write the vision statement well, if you do all of that initial branding and initial stuff well, it, it goes on, it doesn't die after you go. And so that was like a really great learning experience for me. So what did I learn from working in design studios? Presentation skills are everything. Of course, this is something I'm still trying to work on. But uh, I saw a lot of the sort of senior creative directors and senior designers being so good at presentation. And I was like, yeah, it doesn't matter how good you are as a designer. What matters is being able to talk about it. So this was my sort of learning at that time. The other thing I learned was it's OK to say no. I had some really cool bosses who fired clients <laughs> and who said, oh, no, we don't want to do this project. Uh, I had one boss who said, oh, we don't want to do cigarette-related advertising. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. You can say no, but they're offering so, you know, it's a huge contract, but they didn't care. So I think um, that's something I, I find and I really respect that about design studios. The other thing I learned is, <laughs> or at that time, my feeling was, hey, it's really tough to work with non-designers. And most of my job in design services was dealing with CEOs and you know engineers and marketing executives and all of this stuff. So I was like, OK, this is probably something I need to get better at. Level two is freelancing. So I left design studios, and I tried to do freelancing for a while. Uh, it didn't end very well, so it was a bit like the wild, wild west. Anything could happen. Uh, there was no protection from any senior creative directors. You never knew what your client was going to say at any time. And uh, I think I had this one really difficult client who kept changing requirements. And it suddenly made me realize as a designer, oh, it's not just about the craft. All my bosses have continuously protected me from this you know, harsh reality. And yeah, I, I found the hard way that sometimes checks bounce, and then nothing can be done, and you've already delivered the files. I was like, oh no, yeah. So this was an interesting learning to me and uh, in the beginning or, you know, of my career. The other thing is freelancing puts you in a weird position of working alone from home. And I think personally for me, I realized this is just not fun. And I'm very dependent on other people to have discussions and interesting interactions. And I was like, maybe I should get back to this when I actually know what I'm doing and when I'm not just sort of struggling in the dark. So I felt at this time that I should learn more about what I was trying to do in digital, in the digital world. And um, so I took a break from design, and I decided to be a researcher for some time. Uh, so this is when I, uh, and I think uh, during the interview, they were like, oh, you don't have a psychology degree. And I somehow convinced them that I could still do the job. Um, so I joined this company where I became a researcher, and it was like six-month projects where you know you go in to really small towns in India and trying to understand like how do they use the internet, why do they go to cyber cafes, why do women go to cyber cafes, why do men go to cyber cafes. We were trained in all of the sort of usability testing, in-depth interviews, eye tracking, all of the sort of stuff. Um, and then the end of the project was just delivering insights to the designers. So I had no control over the design, which was really tough. But uh, it was a huge uh, learning experience for me. These are some photos I took in those days. And we literally like did a lot of real field research where each project was like six months long and very, very intense. And the end of it was literally just a written document that you handed over. So we did projects for people like Nokia in those days, uh, you know, this is, of course, very long ago, <laughs> so Nokia was real. Um, and I usually, you know, hide this project from a lot of people, but uh, I worked on this uh, matrimonial website. And I didn't do the design for this, but I did all, a lot of the research. I interviewed uh, a lot of potential brides and grooms and parents in India. and. I think it was such a humbling experience to understand 
how complex it is to make a website that people are using. It's not just a website. And I think it made me, this whole experience of being a researcher made me a better designer eventually. So yeah, what did I learn after this stint as a researcher? I realized UX is everything. UX is the most important thing. And uh, I became a huge advocate for UX. In those days, nobody knew what UX was. So you always had to sort of explain the acronym. What is the full form of UX? What is it? What does it mean? Um, and it was a challenge, uh, but it was also super interesting. The other thing I learned uh, from this experience was that research does not mean that you will succeed as a business. Because we had a lot of clients who spent so much money on research, and they still failed. And then we had a lot of clients who didn't spend that much money on research, and they succeeded. Uh, so I knew something. I knew that I didn't know something, but it was still interesting to me that it's not only about doing your research right. There's so much more to it. So that was interesting to me. The other thing I started to realize at this point was that there's a huge disconnect between different people who are working on a product. So there's the design team, there's the business, there's research, there's engineering. Nobody gets along with each other. Everybody's sort of you know, in conflict in some way. And, and this was interesting to me because I saw this as a researcher. I saw this as a designer. And I was like, OK, this is not really right. Uh, but I went on with it. Um, and in those days, what happened was the technical architecture was already built out. And then you did the UX. And you did as much UX as you could. Uh, now, of course, things are much better. Uh, you know, you do the UX first. You decide what you want the product to be. And then you uh, build out the architecture. I also started to articulate at this point that I don't care about this straight line that you go from an intern to a junior designer to a mid-level designer to a senior designer to a director. I didn't really care about it. And I was just like, I'm just going to keep learning whatever skills I want to learn. And um, I was OK with it. Because even the researcher, I took a demotion to, to take that job. And at that point, people were like, oh, why are you doing that? But I was just like, hey, this is super interesting. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing that. Um, so yeah, I think. It's, it's important to say this, which is that throughout, uh, especially looking back, I realized that I didn't really care about the promotions that much. It was more about, is this interesting? Uh, is this a new skill that I'm learning? And I think Kenny also mentioned that in his talk. You know, Whenever something new came along, I was like, hey, I, I really want to do this. This is, I think, uh, the a significant part of my career, which is UX consultancy or design services. I worked in small companies that did it, larger companies, corporates, a lot of different kinds of places. This is a sustainable leather factory that I worked in. Um, so it's, uh, the design team was inside the leather factory. And uh, it was super interesting to me because I'm so like from digital and always in digital. And I was scared of even working with print. But this was interesting because you know we had designers actually working with the leather and the materials. And I said, OK, maybe I should try it. This on the top right hand corner, you can see a photo of, of the auntie that would make all the bags. And um, again, it was sustainable and uh, vegetable dyes and all of that. Uh, so I learned a lot about material and process during this time. And uh, what I ended up doing was helping them uh, do the interiors of all of their stores across the country. So there were hundreds of stores across the country. And I would work with the craftsmen to uh, fabricate these brass cubes and then distribute them uh, across the stores. And I even started doing ops work and actually like planning how to distribute the cubes. And what happened was that the cubes were made out of sand casting. And sand casting is this really ancient process. Uh, uh, of working with uh, this material. And so it would take really long to make each cube, and it would take even longer to ship it to the store. So it was super interesting to see you know, how much harder it is it when you're not working with digital, and you have to literally like do the real thing. And um, I started to learn more and more about collaboration while I was working with uh, you know, all of these designers and all of these different setups. Uh, you know, it's not just about craft. I realized as a designer, one of your sort of main skills is working with other people, whoever they are. And that's kind of 
crucial to becoming successful. So I uh, finally went into uh, you know product uh, kind of 100% at this point. Uh, started doing a lot of iPhone apps, iPad apps, and this was around the time that there was this massive app boom. Uh, you know, people were just making all kinds of apps, and and I kind of started doing that too. So this is um, a hospital app that I worked on. I worked on various industries from medical to fintech. Uh, you know, really um, got into the whole sort of wireframe and visual design process. Uh, worked with various clients in in San Francisco, uh, in UK, and kind of all over the world. These are just a few. Uh, images of uh, some of the apps that I worked on and also at this point I finally got promoted and became creative director this was uh, to be honest very important for me because personally it's something that I had always sort of imagined in my mind when I was in design school that oh I will graduate and then eventually become a creative director but I think when when this actually happened I realized, oh my God, this is really difficult. And also, uh, I was in charge of a 25-person team, and I realized that I had uh, bitten off more than I could chew, and it was really, really tough uh, to handle a big team like that. Uh, you know, So it was super interesting, though, and I learned a lot. And as I became senior management, I think uh, my picture of the disconnect between various teams uh, became clearer. I realized it's not just about design and business, and it's like front end and back end and QA and business and sales and marketing, and the sales guy is saying something to the client, and the client is just like, "What's going on?" And in all of this big picture, the users, the actual users who are using the thing, are lost. And this is the kind of uh, problem that occurs in a lot of sort of client services industries. You're providing a design service, but you're very limited by the structure of the team that you're in and the way the contracts are structured. So um, it, was, it was definitely a challenge and, and I learned a lot, but it was also very limiting. I think as a consultant and as a UX consultant, you provide a fresh perspective and, and that's very valuable and a lot of your clients sort of value that fresh perspective, but of course it's limited. And when you realize it's limited, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's more like, okay, you know your limitations and now you try to help them as well as you can in that sort of limited uh, set of things that you can do. Um, so yeah, the next story I want to talk about is this project. Um, I think our team, even in that consultancy, we wanted to do product more and more. And so we started doing product accelerators. We took equity from uh, apps that you know we thought were like more interesting than the rest. And then we started sort of contributing to that at another level. We even sort of invested in some of them. Um, I'm not sure if this is one of those accelerators, but I think this is a good example because we worked really, really closely with the founders. We built that prototype uh, from scratch, and then they used that prototype to get funding. And this was my first sort of uh, exposure to that whole process. And I was like, hey, this is so interesting. They are building out a prototype. They are putting it in the South American market. So this was for a, a Spanish-speaking uh, audience. And we, we didn't know so much about it. But as a consultancy, uh, we did as much as we could to understand uh, the situation. But the founders obviously were the ones who were the closest to the users. And, and that was very interesting because we were too far away to really understand their context. Uh, still, I did the logo uh, for this. And it was interesting because I was finally sort of coming back full circle using all of my research and wireframing skills and all of that, but also coming back and doing logo design. I remember I did 25 versions of this logo. And uh, my boss at the time, was like, are you sure about this? Are you like, you know, in danger of quitting? And, you know, are you really frustrated? I was like, no, it's okay, because I was actually having a lot of fun doing the logo concepts. And uh, the founders were, of course, very difficult to work with. And they, every option I gave them, they were like, no, no, no. And I think over three weeks, I did 25 options. Uh, it was super interesting, though. And eventually, they, are, they were happy with this. Um, and they gave us a good review. and. Uh, I, I think this company was eventually acquired, um, but still a very interesting sort of project. 
uh, we also worked with this other product called Checkout, uh, which is a point of sale app. And uh, that company also got acquired and eventually became like a proper product company. So it was super interesting to work with all of these various apps that were kind of breaking off and becoming full-blown products and services. At this time, I also realized designers are really hard to work with uh, because, of course, you have to continuously keep them happy as a team. Uh, you have to try and understand uh, what kind of you know, projects do they like, what kind of projects do they not like. Uh, you know, I uh, you know, had to deal with the senior engineers who were like, really unhappy with some, some of my designers. I had to understand their complaints. And I was like, oh, yeah, my designer shouldn't have said that. But then, uh, you know, it was just, I think what, what I realized at this point is just people are hard to work with. It's not about whether you're a designer, you're not a designer, or you're an engineer. It's just people, and people have all of these d sort of different interests. And, and as a team lead, you have to kind of support them. This is all the, also the time I think I was uh, truly, I truly became a member of the world of technology. I was like, oh my god. I uh, love, uh, I think, this whole sort of, you know, this sort of vast universe that is out there of digital stuff. Um, I started trying to code at this point. Uh, it didn't go very well, but I was still very excited about uh, all of the options that were out there. Um, when we were making apps, it was about, you know, version four, uh, 5, 4 or 5. And every time it went to 6 and 7, our clients came back to us and wanted an update. So. Uh, it was very interesting uh, for us as a design team, as an engineering team. Every time a new version of iOS came out, we were super excited. It was a very exciting time to be uh, in the industry because you know going from five to six was a huge leap. Uh, now I think it's it feels very different when a new version of iOS comes out. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I was also very obsessed with uh, the Apple HIG. Every time. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the human interface guidelines. Every time a new version came out, we would all read it, we would be very excited, and we would talk about it. When I start, started working, it was, I think, about Android 2.3, which is gingerbread. Um, but then it went from sort of gingerbread to honeycomb to ice cream sandwich. Um, and it was, I think, one of the most exciting times was when we sort of saw the change that came from going three from 3.0 to 4.0, because uh, I think Ice Cream Sandwich was a turning point for Android. And it also start, made me start to realize, oh, Android, that's also a product. And you know they are also going through like product iterations, and it's very difficult for them. And they are struggling. And how are they struggling? And how are they sort of updating it? Rather than just being a consumer of Android or just the consumer of iOS, I started to understand what they are going through as a team. And you know, uh, the early versions of Android phones had hardware buttons, which were the menu buttons. And that had to be internalized. And I was you know, really feeling bad for them that they have to do something like that. And that change is so difficult. So uh, I think this was uh, another step for me to, cl to becoming closer to understand like, how difficult it is to work in product and what are the various sort of factors involved. We also ha started having more fun with it. So Google Glass came out then, and uh, two, three designers from my team, we came up with a you know, uh, kind of concept for Google Glass and how it can be better, because you know, we were not happy with it. <laughs> so this concept actually got uh, featured in Wired, and it was very exciting for us. And we also started doing agile sprints at this time. Of course, we thought it was agile at that time, but now I know that was not agile. Uh, because uh, the client wasn't there, and uh, you know somebody from the client side would maybe be there in the daily standup, but it wasn't really uh, a daily standup without without the product owner. But we tried as much as we could. Uh, we had an agile coach in our team. It was a 200-person company, so making the company agile was super difficult. Um, we had hats and badges, and the agile coach would like follow you around. Uh, and I was leading like four different projects, so the agile coach would like follow me from one stand up to the other, and like scold me if I was like not being uh, properly uh, agile. <laughs> so it was, 
it was quite a hard uh, i think it was not easy for me uh, to switch to agile and that's why i have a lot of empathy for people who uh, resist the change uh, because i also resisted the change uh, so it was uh, super interesting this is also i think one of the things that i really learned out of this whole experience is you know what motivates a team uh, i don't know uh, there's no answer but i realized this is really hard uh, you know when you put a app out into the store and it doesn't get featured in the top 5 instead it starts getting you know one star reviews and all the engineers are depressed and you know it's really difficult to to motivate a team and then the client becomes very unhappy and is telling you you know why is my app getting like one star because of some silly bug and so you have to go fix that bug and and sort of keeping the team together is is you know really difficult i think my other big learning was management is not management it's support you are just there as a support person to do everything that needs to be done uh, for the team so if somebody can't do something you are there to support that and pick up that slack uh so uh that's also super interesting i think as a learning the other thing i started doing was uh becoming a design advocate so i started talking about uh my design experiences i started going to workshops uh, i started running my own workshops um and attending others this is uh, one of the sort of fellowships that i did with the british council and uh this is also the time i decided to do my post grad and uh i so during my post grad in the uk i started doing installations and uh, that's a photo of a tiny girl who really loved my installation uh she was very very excited she had never seen an interactive installation before and this was more of my personal practice but also of course heavily influenced by technology and then uh i got an offer from an ad agency so i was very excited this was again something that i had never done before so i had to do it uh it was uh, another demotion <laughs> and uh i think uh, this was interesting because it just sort of clarified a lot of my thinking around uh how teams are structured and where um where is design placed in the decision tree of your of your company and your team uh you know and sort of your experience as a designer and your effectiveness as a designer is completely uh controlled by where you are in the company structure and everywhere you go whether it's a design studio or a really corporate consultancy or a smaller consultancy or an ad agency it's slightly different designers are the same everywhere it's just you know uh, everybody is awesome it's just that depending on where you are you're either more frustrated or less frustrated about being a designer and uh it also made me realize why certain companies are structured in certain ways so for example uh microsoft uh you know teams are sort of vertically structured because you know the design team of xbox and the design team of uh you know windows is obviously not the same team it's it's a different team right but in apple it's sort of horizontally structured it's the same design team working across various products and it's not that this is wrong or right it just makes sense because in apple you want all your products to be connected you want all of them to sort of be related to each other and that's what they're working towards and so it's the same team it's the same design team across but for microsoft obviously the xbox design team is going to do something completely different from the windows design team okay um so yeah i worked on this project which was sort of more workshopping with ad agencies and really sort of helping them and introducing them to agile and uh, this is one project that i always talk about again this is a client situation where you're providing a service to a client so you're limited so we created a prototype and gave it to them uh, and then we did a lot of workshopping so we could sort of introduce design thinking into the team and they were really happy with the website because they made a cake out of it <laughs> this is kind of like i think the most fun part of being in a consultancy but also the kind of negative in that you chase the client's happiness and it's very rewarding because clients get super happy and they make a cake like this and this cake the photo was sent to me on instagram by the head of it in in jordan and she was really excited we gave them the prototype but it took them one year to actually build this by the way <laughs> so um after it it was very deserving of a cake cuz they they deserved that cake <laughs> but um i think it's interesting because 
I still don't know how useful this website is to the users. I had no, I have no visibility to, of that. All I know is it was a success because our clients were happy, and and that was the sort of, I think for me the internal conflict of not working in product. Yeah, it also made me realize advertising is a whole different animal. It's this whole different industry that I really don't know anything about. Uh, it was a learning experience, but I think I'm still learning about it. The other thing I realized is a lot of designers care about awards. This was news to me. I think I'd went through my whole career completely uh, not knowing about this. Uh, but being in an ad agency made me realize that, hey, this is really important. In fact, getting awards actually makes clients come to you. And then finally, uh, I went back to product. So um, I started working with Postman. and. We uh, first started off with this uh, very simple looking Chrome extension, which had about 30, 40,000 users. And uh, we converted it into a full blown product, uh, you know, with a web app and Mac app and uh, 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 C a CLI. We also did branding. So again, I, you know, use my sort of typical uh, style to do the logo, which is very sort of geometric um, and simple. And, kind of, and also we use some illustrations. So you can see some of the illustrations here. This is what the website looks like right now, which is great. I think uh, you know, even after I'm no longer with the team, they are still continuing with the branding, and, and this is really important. So uh, I think one of the stories that's really important about product and, and I think really representative of Postman was uh, you know, we came up with this new feature called the code generation button, which the team had worked on for like four or five months. But then, when we released it to the product, uh, to the live to the product, nobody was using it, and all of the engineers were depressed because they were like, "What happened?" We, you know, because we did all the user feedback, we did all the testing and everything, and everybody wanted it. And then when I looked at it, it looked like it was just an icon. And the icon was really abstract, because coming up with an icon for a feature like code generation within API testing is very abstract. So I said, you know what, let's just make it into a text button for now and see if it works. And the next day, we had hundreds of people kind of tweeting at us saying, my mind is blown by this new feature. It wasn't a new feature. It had been there forever. But they finally saw it. And I think this is the most rewarding part about working in product, that you can make a really small change. Within a day, it's out in production to millions of people, and they instantly feel that and tell you, hey, we really appreciate this. It's an instant sort of feedback loop, and I think that's the best part uh, of working with product. So yeah, what did I learn from this? I learned that shipping continuously uh, as much as you can makes you a better designer. You know, it doesn't matter how good it looks or how you know happy your client is. What matters is are the users happy, uh, and is your business actually doing better? And you know, are people actually more engaged uh, with what you're shipping? Uh, and so, the more you ship, the more you learn. Uh, frankly, it's it's not how many years; it's how many sprints you do as a designer, going live to production. That's actually going to tell you how good you are. Uh, the other thing I learned is is metrics are your friends. I've always avoided math, but I think doing a lot of product automatically makes you realize if you don't understand the numbers, then you don't really know what's going on. And, and uh, it's been really, really interesting for me. This is very, still very new to me. It's only been like two years since I started doing metrics. Uh, but it's been so, so interesting to see uh, you know, user behavior sort of represented in numbers. I've always done usability testing and qualitative interviews since the beginning of my career. So this has been very new. The other thing I learned after working with Postman was don't become the gatekeeper. So this is uh, something that can happen, I think, without you actually realizing it. You shouldn't become the approver of all designs that are going out into the product. Design should be sort of intrinsic in the team. Everyone else should also care about design, and not just the designers. If only the designers care, then the moment those designers are gone, everything falls apart. So what matters is the engineers really need to care about design. The marketing team really needs to care about design. And that's when you are no longer the gatekeeper. And even if you go, everything continues and in fact keeps getting better. So I think 
it's of course very hard to do this, but this is something that was a learning for me. Um, I also started, uh, I think, getting better and better at this process and setting up this process in various companies, which is um, iterative product design, where you know user feedback and insights are the center of your sort of product design process, and you're continuously building, testing, iterating in a sort of uh, circular motion, keep making sort of the product better, keep learning from the insights, because this is not a static thing which you can just hand over. You know, the industry is continuously changing, technology is continuously changing, and so you have to keep trying. And how can we do this best in a really small, you know, lean team uh, where everybody is working really closely together? And so now I'm working with Referral Candy, um, and it's been really, really great because, you know, we've managed to set up a really good metric system uh, to measure all of the user behavior. We have qualitative testing going on. And what's interesting for me is we've just launched a new product called Candy Bar, and we're using everything that we have learned with Referral Candy and all of, of course, all my product experience to make uh, you know, Candy Bar better and better. It's only been a few months since we launched, but we've already redesigned the product like four times. Uh, it's super fun uh, for both the engineering team and the uh, design team. And I think uh, working with both uh, Referral Candy and Candy Bar made me realize that you know, it's uh, user-centric design and user-centric metrics is actually the same thing. So. Um, for Candy Bar, for example, the user-centric metric is just making sure that our retailers have repeat customers coming back because it's a loyalty product. And for Referral Candy, our user-centric metric is the referral revenue that our service helps the retailer uh, get. And so as long as that's going up and as long as those retailers are doing well, it means that our product is working. Uh, so it's super interesting to sort of work towards this. Um, this is a photo of... Uh, uh, Mission Juice and Joel, who is the owner of Mission Juice, and he's one of our uh, customers of Candy Bar, um, and he's in Singapore. So it's super interesting. We are working very closely with all of these uh, retailers uh, to make Candy Bar a better product for small and medium businesses. So yeah, uh, that's about it. So I covered uh, you know, my first commercial project, uh, what it's like for design studios, freelancers, researchers, design services, ad agencies, and product. I hope that some of this was helpful uh, to you guys. I think as a parting note, I just want to say that, you know, explore the design world. Uh, really find out what you want to do and what you like to do. And avoid the echo chamber. I think it's easy to just sort of keep talking to people who are exactly like you in the same industry as you really explore all of the options that you have because there are infinite uh, options out there. That's it from me. Thank you. Uh, that's my uh, handle. And uh, we are hiring. <laughs> okay. uh, any questions? Yeah, any questions? Yeah. I, uh, I Thanks for the, the points that you guys shared. I just want to get uh, both of your input from like, an industrial and UX uh, input. Like, is there a single principle when you start designing or like a design philosophy which defines your style or do you just, it's like when you wake up that day, it's how you feel that day kind of thing. So is there like, a, a single principle which drives your design? Well, I mean, uh, from my point of view, it's user-centered design. So that's pretty like constant. Uh, you know, as long as you build something that people like and enjoy, then you're good. In terms of style and your personal style, it's really up to you. So for me, I, I try to simplify things, simplify the process, uh, and make it fresh. It's always a challenge to make it fresh and make it simple. It's so easy to make it very complicated and fresh. <laughs> it's complicated almost. Yeah, so that, that's always my challenge on how to make this important. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Hi, thanks for your presentation. <laughs> Uh, 
thanks for the presentation. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about um, super apps and very, very focused products. So like for example, Facebook would be an example of a super app which combines many functionalities and many yeah. products together. Um, and now that you're building two products which are quite separate, um, just kind of like, like to know your thoughts about combining products and keeping it separate. Um, yeah, so Facebook is like a massive platform now, um, and that's okay. I think that's just how, you know, that's probably the plan that they had from the beginning. Like, I don't think that happened accidentally. And I think even for Candy Bar, uh, eventually we will, you know, maybe combine all the products together. So it's more about, uh, you know, what is your big vision for the product, right? What is the big sell? So, uh, so for example, for, for Referral Candy and Candy Bar, our big sell is we want to really help the small medium businesses you know uh, companies like starbucks don't need help with building their own loyalty programs right it's the smaller guys who are like having trouble going into digital that need our help and so that's our big vision and if we have to make more products around that and more stuff around that that's fine so i think uh, it's very important to to have that big vision so you're not just building a product for the sake of it you you have a you know overarching kind of kind of goal towards it. So for example, Facebook may internally have their own goals, uh, you know, connecting people. I don't know. It's not just obviously it started off as a Facebook, uh, but I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg always had this big picture that he was building towards and is still building towards. So I noticed you mentioned there were two very different metrics for the two products that you built. Yeah. Um, what was your process in coming up with that? And um, if, let's say, you were to combine the products together, how would you, <laughs> how would you then align or, yeah, as, as a design? Wow, that's a very difficult question. Um, so I think the metric for Referral Candy is easier to define because the product has been live for many years. Uh, we have a lot of customers. Uh, it's doing very well. And we've grown a lot as a team to better define what is the sort of success metric for referral candy, right? Um, and so we can clearly say, yes, it's referral revenue. And if a retailer is getting more and more referral revenue, that means that our service is working for them, right? Candy Bar is still a very new product. Uh, it's a loyalty service. We are still uh, figuring it out. And so right now, I'll tell you that it's about loyalty and it's about getting repeat customers. Um, but in the future, if we learn more about the product, then we can change it. So it's not like some kind of you know, rigid thing that this is the metric that will never change. Um, you know, we are constantly measuring lots of different stuff. And we try to understand what's connected, what's leading to what, and should we change it. So that flexibility has to be there. Yeah. No worries. Hello, Didi. Thank you for the presentation. I have two questions, right? The first is regarding to something which is later on the slides that, you know, there's a lot of companies that did a lot of research that failed, but there uh, are some companies that did data research and succeeded. So how can you ensure the quality of your research in order to um, actually success for your product. The second question I will ask is the story you talked about, how 25 clients, like, sorry, you re submitted 25 uh, different types of logos and the clients keep rejecting them. And I was wondering, is there a way to maybe come up with a way to, you know, how, what, sorry, what is your approach when it comes to really uh, laying out the requirements from an artistic perspective? sense for the logo so there is less or so there's less back and forth or always going with design then Okay. Yeah. Um so your first question I think uh it's about execution. So when you say that good research uh doesn't necessarily lead to success, I think um in hindsight I would say that it's because no matter how good your research is if you don't execute quickly and on time, then your research automatically becomes too old and redundant. So, um, you know, even if we do a six-month project, if the industry has changed by the end of six months, 
then uh, the value of the research is continuously reducing and as I mean in those days it may not have been that bad but now it's like really bad to spend six months doing research right so um, it's it's not just about research I think it's because execution is important how well your execution w was is important and it's not just a one-time thing once you once you push something out you have to continuously iterate uh, and for your other question about logos I think uh, it really depends on the person especially with logo design it's such a personal thing you're making a logo for somebody's company which they own and which they're going to live with for the rest of their life so uh, I think there has to be some empathy and understanding with the founder that hey they really need to like this logo a lot okay because they own the company especially for small businesses I think for larger businesses it's different uh, because there's more people involved and marketing is involved uh, with an individual you just have to understand that person and it's more about a personal relationship I think um, with that particular uh, example uh, it did go slightly out of control and, and I could have managed it, but I was okay with it at that time. So I think it depends on how do you want to manage it. Um, I think one thing that I usually used to do in those days is just present two options or maybe just present one option. Don't present any options. <laughs> uh, that's one way, uh, but of course more risky. Um, the other thing is also to establish your sort of expertise as a designer and try to try to explain that hey I know what I'm doing but it's of course very hard so Thank you. okay <laughs> uh, any other questions okay I think that's it okay thanks everyone <laughs>